Welcome to Victory Christian Outreach Church. A special blessing awaits you as you listen to today's message. Good morning. I don't know what you're going through this morning, you in the auditorium and those who are online, but I just came to tell you that if you give God your whole self, he will turn it around. Amen? And as we were admonished this morning, when he has done it for you, continue to give him the praise. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fail are never enough. But you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there is nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I know it's true I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and faults Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again cause there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing Nothing is better than you. Oh, there is nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory the only one who can you turn mourning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens you turn bones bones into army you turn seas seas into highways you're the only one who can you're the better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you if you believe it sing it with me this morning oh there's oh, there is nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than Turn around and 
around this morning. He turns graves. He turns graves into God. You turn bones. Bones. You turn seas into highways. To highways. You're the only one who can. You turn to God. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one. Declare it with me this morning. Hey, you're the only one who can. Hallelujah. Put up for us First Chronicles chapter 4. Good to see you as always, Elder Valda. <laughs> I told you this woman's age. May love you won't believe. So just leave that alone. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory be to God. First Chronicles chapter 4. Let's back it up a little bit to verse 9. He said, and Jabez or Jabez, whichever way you want to pronounce it, was more honorable than his brethren. And his mother called his name Jabez, Jabez, saying, because I bear him with sorrow. Verse 10 says, And he called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thy hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Father, as we get into your word one more time, we ask that you open the eyes of our understanding that we would behold wondrous things out of your law. Use your word again this morning to lift us to a higher level. Cause your purpose to be fulfilled in and through us. Let signs, let wonders accompany the teaching of your word in Jesus' mighty name. And the people of God say what? Amen and amen and amen. You may be seated. Glory be to God. Now, last week Sunday, I shared some things in the first service, and I believe I needed to be able to share it with the folks in the second service as well. That's why I said I know exactly where I'm going, unless there's a switch. Somebody say amen? amen. Unless there's a, a, a total switch on that, this is the direction that I'm going. In the first service, I wanted to still go back into some of the stuff that I shared and open them up a little bit more, but somehow I knew it wasn't going to work out that way. So we give God praise for what we had in the first service as well. Now in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible says in Joshua 1 8, it said, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. It said, But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. It said, Then you shall make your way prosperous, and you shall have good success. If you notice in there, it talks about meditation leading to you being able to see. Minister Kara was talking about us seeing and being able to see using the word of God. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. We want, we're looking at enlargement in the context of seeing what God sees. God is bigger than we are, and therefore if he's seeing something, us connecting with that would be a greater dimension of vision. The Bible says that without you being able to see appropriately, or put it this way, where there is no vision that the people perish. So it's important to connect with accurate vision. Uh, in the morning, I advertised to the people a book, and I want to share, I mean, the first service, I want to do the same thing to you. In 1986, around May of 1986, somewhere around May 10th, I believe, of 1986, my pastor was sharing on the subject, how to change your own world. And he taught on it. He shared some principles that, you know, will help believers to change their own world. Now, Paul said something. I want you to appreciate this. When Paul began to teach and write, one of the things that the apostle Paul said was that God was going to judge the world according to his own gospel. That another thing that Paul said was that Jesus was risen from the dead according to his own gospel. 
Now, I need you to, rem to remember that Paul wasn't there when Jesus rose from the dead. He wasn't part of the disciples of Jesus. He didn't connect with Jesus at the point in time. But he said that Jesus rose from the dead according to his own gospel. Basically, what Paul had done was that the teachings concerning Jesus rising from the dead and the a connection that he had had, encounters with Jesus, that thing had become his own. It was now his own gospel. Now, so when I heard my pastor teach on this in 1986, May, around May the 10th or so, it became my gospel. I began to teach it. I think that from that time, almost every year, I'll find a time to teach on how to change your own world. Then in November of 1991, we had gotten married on the 9th of November 1991. That was a Saturday. And then the Sunday, because in Nigeria, is unlike here, when you get married, you run away to your honeymoon. It doesn't happen like that in Nigeria. So cultures are different in different places. Once you get married, the next Sunday, mostly your church wedding will be on a Saturday. On the Sunday, you have to be in church for Thanksgiving. You all have to be in church for Thanksgiving Sunday morning. And here's the funny thing. Our local church had three services. The first service starts at 8 o'clock. <laughs> and we had to be there for three services to connect with the people. Also, we're there for, we had gotten married on Saturday, so the, uh, the next Sunday, you know, three services, we had to be there. So there for first service, so you're introduced to the people. We're there, we sat down there, second service, introduced to the people. By the time we finish in the second service, Bishop says, I want you to teach the people and share on the third service. So I was going to preach on the third service. Uh, so just between the second and the third service, we, we went to his office area, the office area. And he said, what, is, what are you going to be passing across? Well, yeah. I said, I'm going to be teaching on how to change your own world. He said, that sounds like a very good topic. You know, that kind of thing. Then I told him, I said, you taught that five and a half years ago. He said, I preached that? I said, yeah. I said, you preached on that about five and a half years ago, how to change your own world. I'm going to be teaching on that. He said, that's interesting. I want to hear it. You know, that kind of thing. So I began to teach. And he sat in the front of the church and writing notes like a madman. You understand what I'm talking about? I got the whole thing from him. But you see, it had become my gospel. It had become my own gospel. So and in passing it across, in it becoming my gospel, it, it, was, it was sounding totally different for him. In fact, after that session, he went on a ministry spree that everywhere he was doing a seminar, he was teaching how to change your own world, coming out of the notes that he got while I preached. <laughs> so after he had gone home to be with the Lord in 1997, I finally decided that I was going to write the book. So the dedication says, in loving memory of Bishop Hafford A. Ilobtaife, founding president and bishop of Victoria of Faith Revival Ministries World Outreach in Nigeria, the man who first shared these principles on how to change your own world with me on Friday, May 10th, you know, 1986. Bishop was tragically assassinated and all that and all that and all that. But basically, what I'm trying to bring out is that it became my gospel. I want you to get this book. It will change your life. Uh, the third point in the book in terms of how to change your own world, I emphasize six things in this book. The first one was that you needed to know that God was not responsible for your tragedy. Too many times people are going through things and they blame God for it. And you needed to know that God wasn't responsible. The second thing was that you had to abide in the word of God. Let abide. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it shall be done for you, my Father which is in heaven and all that. Then the next one, you know, was that allow the word of God to create in you a vision. And that's really what we're teaching or what I'm passing across to you today. The concept of enlargement, seeing what God sees. That number three point says, allow God, let the word of God create in you a vision of what your own world is supposed to be like. And then the fourth principle was to literally call things that be not as though they were. What you're seeing from the word, begin to speak it out of your mouth. And then number five, we said to hold on to your confession, confession. And number six, to give God praise. Now, it sounds pretty simple. But I want you to get into, get into the book. And then you'll be able to get deeper into it and understand it clearer. Somebody say amen. amen. So get a copy of that. And I'm focusing on that third 
point. Everything I'm sharing is actually enlarging on that third point. And we're saying that enlargement rarely is you seeing as God sees. I want to remind you that God is not a man. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 23 verse 19, it said, God is not a man that he shall lie. Neither is he the son of man that he shall repent. He said, has he spoken something? Has he said something? And shall he not do it? Or has he spoken? And shall he not bring it to pass? The key thing is that when God declares, he never lies. God, that when he said that God is not a man that he should repent, he's actually talking about the fact that God does not lie. God does not lie. Whatever God says is the truth. Anything that God says, he has the ability to bring it to pass. I wrote a new note in my stuff and I said, whatever God wills will come to pass. If God wills it, it's going to come to pass. There's nothing that can hinder him. If God wills it, he'll bring it to pass. God cannot be faulted. He's perfect in all his ways according to the word of God. I know somebody's going to remind me that in Exodus chapter 32, that Moses spoke to God and said, Father, repent of the things that you were going to do to your people. And the Bible said, God repented. So when you look at this scripture, it sounds like there's a contradiction. In one place, he said, God is not a man that he should repent. You know, that kind of thing. And then in another, you know, that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. And then another scripture telling you that God repented. Now you need to understand this. It always come with the, this premise that the word of God does not contradict itself. Always come with that premise. No matter what you see, no matter what you read, if you have that premise, then you get a better understanding of what the Bible is saying. For example, let me show you this scripture. Proverbs 26 verse 4. Look at Proverbs 26 verse 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly. Watch it. Lest thou also be like him. The very next verse, answer a fool according to his folly, you know, so that he does not think that he's wise. Now, when you look at those two scriptures, just on the surface, it looks like a contradiction. Answer not a fool, answer a fool. But they are not the same. They are not contradicting each other. It, the two different things is actually bringing up. And that's why I say the first premise you start whenever you look into the word of God is that God's word does not contradict itself. Somebody say, what do you mean? This is a contradiction right there. In fact, put up both verses so that people can see them clearly. The first one says, answer not a fool. What is the premise for answering not a fool? You know, so that you will not be looked upon as a fool. So you, cut, you catch that. Then the second one says, according to his folly. Then the second one says, answer a fool according to his folly. But look at the second premise. What's the second premise? So that he does not think that he's wise. So that already tells you the difference. That already tells you it's not a contradiction. It would have been a contradiction if it said, answer not a fool according to his folly, you know, so that you will not be seen as a fool. And the second one comes and says, answer not a fool according to his folly, you know, I mean, answer a fool according to his folly so that you too will not be seen as a fool. That would have been a contradiction. But it's not a contradiction. There is something we call the law of contradiction in understanding thought. It's not just scriptural thought, but it's a rule of thought. The understanding is also you use the mathematics. Are you getting what I'm saying? You know, if, if how did you put it? If, if something is A, it cannot be not A. Did you catch it? It sounds funny. If this lady is Kara Friday, then there is no time that this lady is no longer Kara. You understand what I'm talking about? That's a rule of contradiction or not contradiction like some of people will call it. So that if this, if this is what it is, then that is what it is. It does not switch. You capture it. That's, it's a law of thought. It's one of the ways that you bring, is the, they call it the third or the first law of thinking. That if this is what it is, then that's what it is. There's no contradiction there. So you come to God with that kind of premise, that he does not contradict himself. If he's God, then he's God. Then he's not switching from being God. He said, I'll change not. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to switch around. So what is the key thing here? The key thing there is the power of speech. The effect of speech. So if a fool is talking and the effect of that speech cannot change anything, it's not going to make things worse, don't answer. 
It's about picking your fights well. If a madman on the street, in Frederick Street, stops you around Park Street, corner of Frederick Street, and starts to call your name, you that stupid fool, you that this, you that that. There was a particular fella, you know, mad, you know, in, you know, in St. Anne's Hospital. I used to be, you know, working in St. Anne's Hospital. Every time the fella see me, he'll cuss me, you know, you better me, you're this, you're this, your mother so, and so on and so forth. He'll cuss all. I never wanted to turn to him. But one time they were doing carnival in St. Anne's Hospital, and he put up something, uh, you know, when they're doing Omas. He had a, he, you know what, I leave St. Anne's Hospital so long, eh? But he have his own, this thing, he put Dr. Bellamy. He put Dr. Bellamy, and he put on one side doctor, he put on the other side pastor. He said he confused, he didn't know which one he is. You know that kind of thing. So he waving that, that he was waving. That was his master. You know, he bellamy, David he Bellamy, on one side pastor, on one side doctor. So that, you know, so I never stopped to ever answer him at any point in time. Never stop. Never waste my time to stop answering. Because if I start to answer the man on the road, what do you? And all that kind of thing. You know what people are going to say? Aha! So his speech ain't doing nothing to me. So that's the concept of answer not a fool according to his folly. So that people don't think that you too, you're a fool. You understand? But how about if you went to your PTA? And somebody stood up in the PTA and they said, there's a new book we're going to be introducing. And we're saying this book must be introduced to the children. And this book is emphasizing how children need to learn the importance of gay parenting. And all that kind of thing. And how children need to understand that that is normal. We need to accept it. That is the way it is now. And they, some family could have two men as the mother and father. Some families could have two women as mother and father. And we need to make sure we accept this because this is what it is. And then you sit down there and keep quiet. Then you have missed the point. The sec that is where you answer a fool according to his folly. You see, you understand? So that he does not think that he is wise. You capture the thing. So those the two, so there's no contradiction. It's about the power of speech. So the same way, when the Bible says that God does not repent, and then God, the Bible turns around and tells you that God repents, you need to understand what he's talking about. In the context of God not repenting, it's talking about the providential will of God. Whatever is the providential will of God, which has no effect, which has no, uh, how do you call it? Man's will, man's position, man's actions don't have anything to do with it. God never changes his mind. For example, God told Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I already set you up, I anointed you, I knew you, I called you to be a prophet. There's nothing Jeremiah is going to do to change that. There is nothing, there's no way you can convince God that Jeremiah is not a prophet. That is the providential will of God. And God never changes his providential will because his providential will is always in your favor. It's always in your favor because he knows the thoughts that he thinks towards you. Thoughts to make sure that you got prosperity. Thoughts to make sure that things work out for you. Thoughts for your welfare so that things will be good for you. It's so wonderful that the Bible will turn around and say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That love of God is unconditional. Nothing is messing that up with that love of God. Are you following what I'm saying? However, what if you mess up? What if you decided not to do things in accordance with God's will? So there is a judgment that God has put in place that is supposed to follow through. And because you messed up, you were supposed to experience certain things. God said, you messed up, I'm going to do you this. You messed up, I'm going to mess you up. You messed up, I'm going to, what, 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 whatever you want to call it. Then suddenly, you know, while you're going through that, and you're about to go through this major stuff, this judgment that is going to wipe you, punitive stuff that's going to come on you. Suddenly, you begin to beg and say, Father, I'm real sorry. I'm real sorry. You decided to repent. And as you repented, what happens? God changes his mind. Because this now is his consequential will. This will of his is based upon your action. It is because of your foolish action that this is going in this particular direction. So now God changes because you have switched. What if you didn't say anything? 
And then suddenly somebody else began to beg on your behalf. They began to repent on your behalf. They began to connect with God. They began to plead with God on your behalf. God can also move in the context of that individual to make sure. That's what Moses did. He moved on. He was pleading to God on behalf of the children of Israel and God changed his mind. So in the context of God's consequential will, God repents. He will repent of his consequential will because his consequential will is not necessarily always in your favor. You understand what I'm saying? So he wants to repent from that to bring you back to his providential will, which is in favor. Are you following me here? And so God is not, the, we need to understand that God knows all things. He is the infinite God. He's omnipresent, so he's everywhere. He's omniscient. He knows all things. Bible also describes him as omnipotent. He is all powerful and all that. And I, there's another word that I found out some years ago. He's omnificient. You understand? Which means he's the creator God. He knows every single thing. He created everything else so nothing can mess him up. Somebody say amen. He is limitless. So with him then all things are possible. Because he's limitless. All things are possible. With him, nothing shall be impossible. So once we can, what I call renew your with him status, so you know that you are with him, then you can expect things to work out in a particular way. Child of God, I want you to understand this. Whenever you start to line God up with impossibilities, it gets God vexed. You're literally grieving God when you line him up with impossibilities. That's why whenever people walk in unbelief, it gets God vexed. Take a look at Psalm 78. Look at Psalm 78, verse 41. The 78th Psalm, verse 41 of it. I told you, God is, look at him. The Bible says, yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited, can you see that? They limited the Holy One of Israel. God was, back up to verse 40 a little bit, God, back up to God, verse 40, so you get a perspective. He said, how often did they provoke him? They provoked him. What did they, well, how come did they do? They provoked him in the wilderness. And did what? They grieved him in the desert. God was grieved by the things that they were doing. What was it that they did that provoked God? What was it that they did that grieved God? Bible said in verse 14, they turned back. God was leading them forward. But they turned back and tempted God. You heard Minister Rawl this morning when he was talking, when he said something about the fact that people were giving phenomenal praise unto God. And then shortly after, the same people began to give praise, but it wasn't to Almighty God. And we believe God that that will not be our portion in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. I said that will never be our portion in Jesus' name. We will not be of them that turn back unto perdition. According to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38, it said we are not of them that turn back unto perdition, but we are of them that are going to believe to the saving of the soul. So we see in here what they did that God God upset was that they stopped believing in God in the context of God being omnipotent, in the context of God being omniscient, in the context of God of God being omnipresent, in the context of God being omnipotent. They turned back on him and limited him. God doesn't tolerate being limited. He doesn't want to be seen in that way. You see, because he sees things very differently. The way he sees is not the way that man sees. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, when God sent Samuel to the house of Jesse to anoint him a king, when God got him there, he, he began to ask Jesse, who are the sons? Jesse brought the first son. I think it's Eliab or so. Take a look at verse 6 of, of 1 Samuel 16. He said, and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab. And said what? You know, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So he's looking at Eliab in this particular way. And then verse 7 said, but the Lord said unto Samuel, no, 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 no. You see him differently. He said, and Samuel, he said, look not on his countenance. That means just don't look at the outside. Too many times we prejudge things by just looking at things on the outside. He said, don't look at that. Don't look at his height. Don't look at his stature. Because I've refused it. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. So the way man sees is not the way that God sees. He said man is looking on the outward appearance. And that is why people can be fooled 
changed by looking on their outward appearance. We need a prophetic connection, you know, from the inside so that we can discern things accurately. Because as far as God is concerned, God looks to the heart and not on the outward appearance. When the Bible says that God looks to the heart, what he's actually saying is that God is able to see what man does not see. God is able to look beyond what man is, whatever it is that is stopping man, God doesn't have those limits. You need to understand that God lives in a limitless realm. A realm that I call, you know, a, a realm that cannot be limited by space. It can't be limited by knowledge. It can be limited in any way in the context of power. Because remember, he's omniscient. Yeah, remember, he's omnipotent. Remember, he's omnipresent. So he can't be limited by any of those things. He's omnipotent. He's the one that creates every single thing. He is not in that space. So he can see the heart. That means he can see what man does not see. But we, on the other hand, as humans, in this physical body, we are limited by time and space. Right now I'm here. And uh, that is a wall that is right in there. And because that wall confines me into this space, I can only see what is in this space. I can't see beyond that wall. But God, on the other hand, is not limited by that wall. So he could see what's beyond that particular wall. But we, on the other hand, we're blocked. Space stops us. Our physical sight limits us when we operate in the context of our physical sight. That's why he turned around and he said to us, don't walk by sight. Don't walk by sight. Every time you walk by sight, you're going to be limited. He said, walk by faith and not by sight. Every time you walk by sight, you are going to be limited. You see, faith is actually the ability to see into the realm of the spirit. That's why the Bible will tell you in Hebrews 11 verse 1, it said, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That means not seen in the natural. So through faith, I can go beyond what I see in the natural. Faith gives me access to a place where my natural eyes can't go. I can see beyond that. I can see beyond that. I can see in the context of the spirit. Somebody say amen. So faith really is seeing into the realm of the spirit. So when I operate by faith, I now begin to see like God. I'm now in the space where God is. I can see what he's seeing. I can see how he's seeing things. I'm not limited again by the stuff that is on the outside. Faith is seeing into the spirit realm and acting based on that thing that you have seen. If you look in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3, he said, through faith we understand that the walls were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen, or put it this way, the things which are seen around, they were not made of things which do appear. That means that the things that you're seeing did not need anything that you see in the natural to come to pass. Therefore, if you come into that place where you don't see anything in the natural, don't get into that place where you're alarmed. Don't get into that place where you're scared because you never needed anything you could see in the natural to produce what God wants to produce. Are you following what I'm saying? Never needed that to get into the place that God wants to take you. So he's in calling us so that we can see like him. And here's the interesting thing. Because we need to see like he's seeing. We just said if we're going to see like him, then it means that we're going to walk by faith. Now, if you look into the word, I, 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 it, because this is why it takes faith to please God. Because seeing in faith is like seeing where God is. You know, uh, before I get into what I was about to say there, I remember a scripture. 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 2, verse 9. In fact, it's one of the scriptures on which this book is actually based. It's a, a, a part of it, the scriptures that it comes through. In verse 9 of it, it said, it said I had not seen. Then it said, ear had not heard. Then he said, neither has he entered into the hearts of men. The things that God has already put in place and planned for those people that love him. That he has prepared for the people that love him. He said, then in verse 10, it's an interesting verse. He said, but God has revealed them unto us, watch, by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things. 
So there are things that I might not have seen, but praise God for the Holy Ghost. He's able to search all things. He's the Spirit search at all things. And yea, the deep things of God. He said, for no man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of the man that is in him. And he said, also no man knows the things of God, save the spirit of God. He said, now we have not received the spirit that is of this world, but the spirit that is of God, so that we may know the things that have been freely given unto us. Of God. Are you following what I'm saying? So here's the thing. So I know if I can connect with the Spirit, then I can see. But here's another thing. The Word and the Spirit agree. For Jesus said in John 6, He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. So if I'm not even sure where the Holy Ghost is or what He's doing, let me get into the Word. Let me just get into the Word. If I can get into the Word, then I can see what God is saying. God's word begins to open my eyes. God's word becomes my clue to what God sees. I can see what he's seeing in the context of his word. Now you can begin to understand when the Bible tells you things like that the entrance of the word gives light. Then when the Bible tells you that the word of God is a light to your path. And it is, how did he put it? He said, light unto, how do you put it? Uh, the, God's word is light unto your lamp. He said, Aha, uh -huh. light to your path and lamp to your feet and all that kind of stuff. Basically, what he's simply trying to tell you is that God's word will show you the way. You can see what God is seeing through his word. Because his word reveals his essence. His word reveals his will. His word reveals his thoughts. If you read in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 55 from about verse 8 or so. He said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Then he didn't stop there. So if you stop there, then he might have meant that he doesn't want your ways to be his ways or your thoughts to be his thoughts. He went on to say this. He said, but hey, I want you to realize, uh, even though my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your ways. He said, but watch, as the rain comes down and snow from heaven, comes from heaven connects with the earth. He said, as, as the heavens are higher, first of all, he said, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts, and my ways higher than your ways. So his ways and his thoughts are considered as heaven. Your ways, my ways, and you know, are considered as earth. But he said, it's not like that just. I don't want that space. I don't want that gulf between us. He said, the rain comes from heaven. Snow comes from heaven. And it connects to the earth. Literally makes it bored makes it produce. That means without my thoughts, without my ways, you'll be unproductive. But the moment my thoughts and, you know, connects with your thoughts, you're bored. You'll become productive. There'll be bread to the eater. There'll be seed to the sower. There'll be bread to the eater. Some great things are going to happen. He said, this is how, what is that now that is connected me to you? He says, so is my word that is gone out of my mouth. He said, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that for which it is sent. So really, his word carries his thoughts. His word carries his will. His word carries his ways. And if we can connect with his thoughts, if we can connect with his ways, then we can have his ways. Then we can be certain about what God is seeing. Whatever is in his thoughts, that's what he's seeing. If the word of God says it, then that's what it is. The word of God then becomes the realest thing. If you want to put it that way, in inverted commas, the realest thing in this universe. Because you see, the problem with us a lot of times is that we never see the word of God as real. We, we see our experiences as real, but not the word. So somebody tells you, you know, God was said so and so. You know, the Bible says so and so and so and so. You turn around and say, yeah, but you know, in reality... But in reality, the reality is, and your, self, your reality is always away from the word of God. I need you to understand that irrespective of what you are experiencing, that is not reality in comparison to the word of God. Amen. In John 17, verse 17, Jesus said, I want you to sanctify them by thy truth. The word truth there is the word reality. 
Use reality to sanctify them. Use reality to set them apart. If they can be real, if you can get something real onto them, that will set them apart. Then he goes on to say, thy word is truth. So your word is real. So there is nothing as real as the word of God. Nothing you're dealing with as real as the word. His word is revealing to us who he is, revealing to us because you know the Bible said in the beginning was the word, the word was a God, the word was God. So it's revealing to us who is the essence of God, the nature of God, the will of God, the thoughts of God, the mind of God, and all that. So the word is giving us a view, God's world view, so to speak. That's what the word of God is giving to us. So I ask three, two questions, and I'm going to make three statements and close. First question. Before I ask the question, I hear, first of all, I know it's not Christmas, but I remember this. I hear God asking the question, do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? I hear him ask you a third time. You see, I'm from Africa. And the part of Africa that I'm from, they always say this three times. Do you see what I see? They'll call your name like three times and then ask you, you know, well, how many times did I call you? When somebody asks you that, you know this is serious. Dion. Yes, mommy. Dion. Yes. Dion. How many times I called you? Three. You know that's serious. That one is serious. Forget it. <laughs> That's a high level. <laughs> Are you, so I've, called, I've given you the question three times. So that makes it serious. I mean, do you see what I see? That's the first question. So really, I'm asking you three questions. The second question I'm going to ask you, are you seeing what the word says? Are you seeing what the word says? Jesus made a statement in John 8 from verse 31. The Bible said, and Jesus spake unto those Jews that believed in him. They can lock them. And the Bible said, he said to them, he said, listen. He said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And he said, as you do that, then you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. I keep telling people. There is no pastor on the face of the earth that can make you free, no matter how anointed they are. A man of God can be used of God to set you free. A man of God can be used of God to do what? Set you free. But they can't make you free. Being made free has to do with the truth that you have chosen to embrace. That is the reason why we could cast out devils from people. And shortly after, the person is worse than they were. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It's not because the man of God was not anointed. It's because of a lot of the times of the individual what they did. In the first service, I was sharing with us about a woman that got healed from blindness. Right here. Completely blind. Not partially blind. Totally blind had two eyes, the black in the eye was totally white because she had glaucoma so bad for so many years, everything was gone. She was totally blind. We had prayed for her several times, you know, and that was it. Sister Sylvester was her name. Her husband's cousin or family member is, is Elder Sylvester from the Marival Church. I never knew they were related. I didn't know there was a relationship. One day, we had a special healing service right across there. That's where the man, that woman stood. And I walked up to her, laid my hands on her. Pastor Marcia was kind of assisting me, you know, in, while I was ministering to people. Laid my hands on her. Took my hands off her. She began to scream, I can see. I can see. I can see. You see, a man can die and go to hell for lying. You know, <laughs> up right there. You know, so I can see. I can see. Then I answered. I said, what do you see? She said, I can see you. They said, when said I can see her, I, I began to walk around. I said, well, if you can see me, then follow me. I walked, walked around the church, walked around. She never bounced into any chair, moved around, turned around, moved around, and brought back. But do you know that Sister Sylvester died blind? Now, that part of the story, the first service people didn't hear. 
<laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? The first service people didn't hear that. Sister Vesa saw clearly for three months plus, and after that, she became blind again, completely blind again, and died blind. <laughs> she saw for three months, walked around, everything was okay, and all that, and then she became blind again. No man of God can make you free. Man of God can set you free, but can't make you free. It's the truth you know that makes you free. Did you capture what I'm saying? Why God allowed her to see for uh, about three to six months? I don't know. I didn't make her see in the first place. So don't ask me. Anybody here from Guyana? Anybody here from Guyana? So, well, uh, the kid Michelle was born in Guyana, so I didn't see no guy, so nobody's going to take offense. And if you're from Guyana and you're watching us, please don't take offense. We all have a way of saying things, so stay with us here. Uh, I remember Pastor Neves was the one who gave this story. This is a real life story. Right at the Garden of Prayer Church on Belmont Valley Road. He said, you know, a lot of guys came from Guyana for a conference at the church there. And um, you see, it's unfortunate, but a lot of us Trinidadians don't come early. So a lot of the Guyanese, more disciplined, came early. And so when they came early, you know, they were there, pretty disciplined. And they came very early for the service. Many Trinidadians were not there. So one of the Guyanese, after waiting for quite a while, went and asked one of the Trinidadians, he said, who leading the worship? <laughs> and the training guy said, don't ask me. I'm not the captain. <laughs> and some of you will get that when you get home. <laughs> uh, some of you finally got it. <laughs> so who leading the worship? <laughs> don't ask me. I ain't not the captain. <laughs> This worship that is going here, are you not the one in charge of it? You see how you guys throw me off? I don't even know what I was saying before I got there. <laughs> what was I saying? Uh, I was about to, but I don't know what I was saying again. You see how you guys so distracting? You see, Minister Carroll, the kind of things that happen to me in church? Uh -huh. Where you get to all this? I didn't reach there. I was in 31, 32. Uh, a man of God can't be, you know. But I don't know how we go into that, but wherever. <laughs> we're still in the ship. Then by say he's still in the ship. Yeah, so the point is, I think where, where he got there, you see how he got he got me back into it. You know what it was? I said, I don't know I don't know how come the woman see for three to six months. Don't ask me. So the same way the man said, Don't ask me. I know the I know the captain. Don't ask me. You understand? Why the woman only see for three to six months? Don't ask me that question. Me and know that. <laughs> I can't answer the question. Amen? So that's the point I'm making. So only God can make you free through his word. So are you seeing what the word says? You see, is, how do you know if you're seeing what the word says? You ask yourself, is what that thing that you're seeing, is it encouraging you? Is it bringing encouragement? Is it bringing discouragement? If it's God, it will encourage you. Is, is what you're seeing comforting you? Is it bringing strength to you? Or is it discomforting you? Is it weakening you? Is what you're seeing drawing you closer to God? Or away from God? So that's what you have to ask yourself. What am I seeing right now? Is it helping me to connect with God? If it's not, ditch it. Just forget it. It's not, it's not, it's not the word. It's not connecting with the word. The Bible says that the word of God is like a mirror. He said, you look into it, it's the perfect law of liberty. That means it will produce freedom. Amen. Number two, who? You see, because words paint pictures. So my number two question, who have you been listening to? What have you been listening to? Because who you're listening to and what you're listening to will determine what you're seeing. What you're seeing is clearly a feature of what you've been hearing. If you hear cat, you don't see C-A-T, you see a cat. You hear dog, you don't see D-O-G, you see a dog. You hear house, you don't see H-O-U-S-E, you see a house. Because words paint pictures. Are you getting me? So it's important. You're, and you see faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So whatever you're listening to, whoever you're listening to, you automatically have faith in them and in what they're saying. And here's what I want you to remember also. Jesus said, take no thought, say it. So it's not just 
somebody speaking to you from the outside. It also has a lot to do with what you are saying to yourself. What are you saying to yourself? Because that's why he could tell you that your words will justify you or condemn you. Because the, whatever you're saying is affecting what you're hearing and that is affecting what you're seeing. So I said something. I said, beware of what you allow into your ear gates. Either by words or songs. There are some people finish listening to a song. They take a gun and go and shoot everybody. Because that's all that song was telling them. Some people finish listening to a song. Rise up strong. <laughs> and do what God called them to do. <laughs> you know, because you see music has a prophetic dimension to it. And music in that prophetic dimension will lead you in the context of that thing. Are you following what I'm saying? Music has a prophetic dimension to it. That's why a lot of the time Bible tells you that come bring yourself into the place where you speak to yourself in psalms and hymns. Spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Don't tie up yourself with so much all kind of stuff. Think about it. Some, you know, some of you, you've grown up, in, you didn't grow up in church all the time. When you listen to either Teddy Pendergrass or whatever it is that you heard in those days, you know exactly. You know what it does to you. Are you getting what I'm talking about? As holy as you are, it just does begin to do all kind of things to you. I'm not going to use this platform to sing some of those songs that you already know. Some of you already. Well, let me keep myself. So beware of what you allow <laughs> into your ear gates. Somebody say amen. Either through words or through songs. Are you getting me? So with that in mind, the three statements I'm making and I close is give the word of God priority in your life. Give it first priority and final authority. If you give God's word, you see... True discipleship has to do with you continuing in the word. As you look at his word, you will see what he says. You will see exactly what God is saying. You'll be able to see it as you look into the word of God. Your vision will become enlarged as you behold the word of God. God told Jeremiah, I've made you a prophet. Jeremiah said, no, you, God, see, I'm a child. God said, I don't want you to be talking like that. Remember what I told you? What you're saying out of your mouth is going to affect what you're seeing. So God says, stop talking and saying that you're a child. Begin to see what I've called you into. Begin to connect with what I've said concerning you. And the moment you can do that, in Jeremiah from chapter 1, from verse 10, when God said, you know, he said, the word of the Lord came unto me again. Look at what he said. You know, I've set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build. Verse 11 said, and the word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see the rod of an almond tree. The rod of an almond tree signified the anointing of God. If you go back to Numbers chapter 17, when they wanted to know who God chose, God told them, take the rod of an almond tree. Put it in the tabernacle of witness. After eight days, you'll see. And the rod, the one that blossomed, that brought forth almonds, God said, that's the person that I've chosen. So when he said, I see the rod of an almond tree, he's simply saying, Father, I'm seeing exactly what you're saying about me. Amen. And here's the interesting thing. The moment that happens, look at the next verse. He said, you have seen well. Now watch what he said. You have seen well. No, 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 no. Same place we are, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12 now. Jeremiah 1, 12. Look at it. Then he said unto me, thou hast seen well. For I will do what? Hasten my word to perform it. The reason the word of God doesn't seem to be coming forth in your life the way that it ought to come is because you ain't seen it yet. So it's not hasten. It seems like it's delayed. Are you understanding me? <laughs> You cannot see what God is seeing and remain mediocre. It's impossible. You will rise. You will get up. You can't see what God is seeing and walk in fear. It's impossible. Them not know their God shall be strong and do exploit. You can't see what God is saying and be in fear. When that young man, Elisha's servant, when he saw the Syrian army, he was scared. Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. Open his eyes so he can see. The moment God opened that young man's eyes and he saw the host of angels that were all around, fear left. That's why it's so important to see what God is seeing. If you see what God is seeing, you won't be scared. You won't be afraid. 
Number two statement I'm making to you is to look at the word continually. Not just to look at it now, but look at it continually. As you look at the word continually, that word is going to show you who you are. It's going to show you what you have. It's going to show you what you can do. It's going to give you the context of all, all the things that are possible unto you. It is going to take you from glory to glory. He said, as we are beholding, as we are looking at that word in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. First of all, he tells you in verse 17 that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You see, I keep telling you the spirit and the word agree. It, the Bible calls the word, the word of liberty. Or, you know, the perfect law of liberty. Then he's telling you the spirit and the word. He said the spirit, where the spirit of God is, there is liberty. And look at verse 18 now. They say, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass or a mirror, the glory of the Lord. And notice what he said, we are changed. We are metamorphosized. We are changed, metamorphosed. We are changed. The same word transformed. We are changed into the same image. That image that we are seeing from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The more you see it, the more the Spirit of God can walk on you and bring that thing to pass. You see, in the natural, when we put a mirror in front of us, the mirror shows the image of the object that is in front of it. But in the Spirit, the Bible or the Word of God is considered the mirror. That mirror, however, rather than showing the image of the object that is in front of it considers the object in front of it as the image. And what is inside it now becomes the constant object. So you now on the outside now has to be transformed into what you're seeing. So as you keep looking at it, you now become transformed into what you're seeing you begin to look more like what you're seeing on the inside. That's why the Bible said, a man that hears the word and doesn't do it is like somebody who looks at himself in a mirror, walks away and doesn't remember what he looks like. So the word is actually showing you what you look like. So now you have to now keep looking at that and seeing yourself so you can think that way, you can operate that way. This word is going to put you at peace. So when the Bible says whose mind is stayed on him, it's talking about you continually beholding. You're literally submitting yourselves to be perfected by God because it's what you're looking at is the perfect law of liberty. This is how you get your mind stayed on God. This is how you submit yourself to be perfected by God. This is what is going to help you manage the conflicts and the anxieties that you face. That's why you're going to be like Paul, 2 Corinthians 4 from verse 7. Look at what he's saying up all the way to verse 10 or so. Look at the 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 7. He said, but we have this treasure in earthen vessel, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now, what is he going to do to you? Look at verse 8. He said, we're troubled on every side, but we're not distressed. Your attitude is going to change. Your perspective is going to be different because you're seeing something different. We're troubled on every side, but we're not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Next verse said, we're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're cast down, but not destroyed. And you get always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Christ may be made manifest in us. Your attitude, your perspectives are totally different because you're seeing the word. Amen. That's all you're seeing. You don't have a victim mentality anymore. Amen. You think like a victor. Susan, where is Susan? Wearing the victor's crown? <laughs> Thinking like a victor. Somebody say amen. amen. Thinking like a victor. From glory to glory. That means a limitless realm. That's where you come into. You come into that. Number three question and I close. Actively. Actively. Reject anything. You hear what I just said? Yeah. Actively reject anything you don't see in the word. You don't see it in the world. Reject it. Reject it. This is exactly what Caleb was doing. When those guys began to talk and give all the bad reports and so on, Caleb said, you guys, forget these people now, man. Let me go forth and take the land. Look at it. Numbers 13, verse 30. And Caleb steal the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Let's go up at once. Reject anything that is not consistent with the word of God. 
Anything contrary to what the word shows you is a lie. The same spirit of contra no contradiction that we're talking about. Wherefore, if the word is true, then anything that is contrary to that is a lie, period. doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter how you feel it. It doesn't matter anything like that. If it's contrary to what the word says, it is a lie. Amen. Put up Romans chapter 4 as we begin to tie it together. Romans 4 from verse 17. Are you all getting anything out of this? We're almost there. See, second service, I get opportunity to teach. Amen. And it takes time to teach. So bear with me. Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I've made thee a father of many nations. Now notice the tenses used. He did not say, I am going to make thee a father of many nations. This is God speaking to Abraham. I have made thee. That's past tense. I've made thee a father of many nations. Before whom, him whom he believed, or like unto him whom he believed. He said, even God who quickened the dead. That means if what you're seeing appears dead, God is big enough to quicken or to make alive the dead. Amen. This is where you are in the realm that is limitless. Yeah. Who quickened the dead and called those things which be not as though they were. This is where a lot of people make mistakes in faith. They think faith is calling those things which be as though they be not. So they woke up this morning with a headache. And you ask them, how are you feeling? They say, well, I got to walk by faith. So I don't have a headache. No, you are lying. You, uh, you just lied. That is not faith. Faith doesn't walk with a lie. Faith does not call things which be as though they be not. How many say, but it's the same. If I, you, you, no, it's not. They're not the same. They are not the same. Faith calls things which be not as though they were. Let me say, I'll show you how they are not the same. Anybody here? Let's just put it this way. Your daughter's name is Carol. You walk into the room. You've been talking to Carol on the phone. She told you she was going to be in the living room. So you stepped out. You just came back home. You opened the door. You stepped into the living room. Carol is not in the living room like she told you she was going to be in the living room. What do you do? You do what? You what? You what? Say it. Nobody's killing you. You what? You call. You call. You call, Carol. You begin. You raise your voice. And you say, Carol. And then she probably somewhere in the back and says, yes, mommy. When she answers you, yes, mommy, then you know where she is. The next thing you might say, come over here. I've got some things or whatever. If she didn't come immediately, you call again. Carol! I call him, come over here. Now, how about if you stepped into the house and as you open the door, the first person you see is Carol. Would you start there and say, Carol! <laughs> Carol! Then they say, but mommy, what's wrong with you? I'm right here with it. So you see, it's not the same. You call what is not, not what is, as do it's not. Did you capture what I'm saying? They're not the same. Do faith calls things that be not as though they were. Calls things that be not. So Abraham, look at what he said, verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Verse 19. What did he do? Be not weak in faith. He did what? He considered not his own body. Now the Bible did not say that his body was not dead. He said he considered not his own body, which was dead, which was now dead, which was now dead, which was now dead. Now, when he was about 100 years old, neither did he consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham did not say, my body is not dead. He did not say, Sarah's womb is not dead. The Bible said he considered it not. He decided to do something. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. What that word strong in faith is the Greek word endunamai. That means he waxed stronger in faith. That means he continued to focus on what God has said and refused to take on his dead body. I'm taking on his dead body. He said, I'm going to take on what God says. 
If God says he has blessed me, so I will agree. So um, he's changed my name from Abraham to Abraham. He's now calling me father of many nations. I will join him and call myself father of many nations. Because that is what is not. What is, is that my body is dead. What is not, is that I'm not father of many nations. So I'm going to call what is not. They capture it, so he kept calling. He kept calling because he's seen what God is seeing. He's seen what God is seeing. He has seen what God is seeing. And then he began to do what? The Bible said was strong in faith. Doing what? Giving glory to God. Verse 10 said, being fully persuaded that what he has promised, he was able also to perform. Once we can see what God sees, our vision will be enlarged. And we'll be able to walk in infinite possibilities. Once we can see what God has seen, our vision will be enlarged. Stand up on your feet. And while you stand up on your feet, I want them to put up Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Hebrews 11, verse 13. I want you to meditate on this scripture consistently, when, especially when you're dealing with issues. Meditate on it all now so that you can be in a better place. I want to show you four quick steps to the high dimension of faith to get anything that you're trusting God for. These all died in faith. Now watch it. These folks died without physically getting it as a physical fact. But you're not moved by that. Your job has nothing to do with what you see physically or what you get physically. That's not it. But notice what they said. They received the promises. Not having, I mean, not having received the promises. They didn't have it as a physical fact. But this is what they did. This is the, this is the, this is the turnaround. Having seen them afar off, they saw it. They saw the promises afar off. As they saw it afar off, the Bible said they were persuaded of them. Then the next verse said they did what? Embrace them and then confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. Watch it now. They saw the promises. So how do you see the promises? You keep looking at the word. As you look at the word, you see it. But when you see it, it's so far. It looks so far. I mean, Sakara, it looks so far. Then he said they were persuaded. That means they were convinced of it. So that means the more you look at it, the more you become convinced of it. The more you become convinced of it. Abraham became persuaded. He became convinced of it. He became convinced of it. Then the Bible said the next thing they did, they embraced it. Now, when something is very far from you, can you embrace it? Can you embrace anything that is so far from you? Can you embrace anything? That, uh, Minister Rock, huh? see where he is right now? Can, can you try to embrace it? No, it's not happening. Could you come closer? 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 Can we now embrace? Boom. Yeah. Thank you. That means when I saw it afar off, and I became convinced. The more I became convinced, it drew it closer. My conviction drew it closer. As I became persuaded, it kept coming closer. And the moment it came so close, it became so close, I took a hold of it. I embraced it. Don't worry about that. Sorry about that, Minister Eddie. And Nick and Sean, sorry about that. But I took a hold of it. I embraced it. Then at this point, I begin to speak. The confession will now bring possession. Because I'm embracing, I'm taking a hold of it. Confession can now bring possession. Somebody say amen. amen. Lift those hands and begin to bless the Lord. I know we took a good while. 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 But praise God. Thank you for joining us. We remain committed to making your life better.